folks start rolling in. Okay, guys, um, let's go ahead and uh, plan to get started. As I mentioned uh, before, it's possible that Shannon Stratton won't be able to join us today, but um, in her absence, we'll just uh, um, keep moving forward, as they say. My name is Dexter Wimberly. I'm a senior critic at New York Academy of Art. Today, I'm joined by three, hopefully four, um, illustrious uh, panelists to talk about uh, artist residencies, specifically their own. And then we'll talk maybe in broader terms about um, friends and things that are happening in the space. I'm joined today by Chris Cook, who's the executive director of Bemis Center for Contemporary Art um, in Omaha, Nebraska. In 2015, Chris Cook moved to Omaha from Miami, Florida to join the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts as director. In this role, he drives Bemis' long range strategies provides creative direction and oversees the financial advancement and operations of the 41-year-old art-founded nonprofit. In 2019, he launched Bemis's Sound Plus Art, pardon me, Sound Art Plus Experimental Music Program, which leads support now totaling $1 million from the Mellon Foundation to advance the creation and presentation of new forms of sound and music by today's leading composers, sound artists, and musicians. Um, I will give Chris an opportunity to share more about himself as we get into today's presentation. But um, in the interest of time, I'd like to uh, introduce our second panelist, Nicole Martinez, who's the Associate Director of Fountainhead Arts in Miami, Florida. Nicole is a veteran arts communications professional and the current Associate Director of Fountainhead Arts Miami. Um, the only Miami's only live work artist residency that has hosted nearly 500 national and international artists since its founding in 2008. She leads the organization's communication strategy while overseeing its fundraising, operational, and administrative departments. Um, very happy to have you here, Nicole. And as I said about Chris, um, there's so much more to um, talk about in terms of your career and the work you're doing. And we'll have ample time to do that as we get deeper into today's conversation. We are also joined by Holly Blake, who's the residency manager at Headland Center for the Arts in Sausalito, California. Holly is a painter who has a BFA and MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. She has served as Headland's Center for the Arts sole residency manager and has worked at Headland for 34 years. Thank you for joining us today, Holly. We're really happy to have you. Thank you, next. So um, as Zoom goes, I always say, you know, it's not a, a you know, it's not a Broadway play. So if the, if the audio gets funky, or you have difficulty hearing one another or me, we can just stop and make sure we can get it sorted out. No one's gonna storm out of the theater. <laughs> um, so um, to begin, we'll, we're gonna go in alphabetical order by order. So I'm gonna come back to you, Chris. I gave a very abbreviated version of your bio, but I'm sure there's a little bit more that you could share with us about who you are and the work you do at Bemis. And also I'm certain there's some curiosity about you know Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> There always is, Dexter, come on. <laughs> first of all, where is Omaha? <laughs> exactly. Well, first of all, thank, thank you so much for, for having me um, on this panel. And Nicole and Holly, it's great to be with you as well. And uh, I do hope that Shannon is, is able to, to join us. Um, as you said in your intro, uh, Bemis Center is an artist-founded uh, nonprofit. Um, it is, uh, as of this year, 41 years old, and we are located in the Old Market Warehouse District in downtown Omaha. So very much an urban location, an urban center of, of the state and, and the region. Uh, we operate um, out of a uh, two-building campus, totaling about 110,000 square feet. And just to give a little more context before going into slide presentation, um, we have about 15 staff members and uh, 20 board members that are located, of course, here in Nebraska, but also throughout the country, uh, several of which are alumni of either our exhibition or residency programs. 
And this year, our operating budget is going to hover around uh, 3 million. So is now a good time to transition to some visuals? Absolutely, absolutely. would love that. So um, okay. you should be able to share your screen as, a, as an alternative host or a straightforward. So let me know if you're able to. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Give me one second as I orientate my screen just a little bit. Okay, can everyone see that all right? Okay, perfect, thank you. So I pulled together about 12 slides and I'll go through this at a relatively fast clip knowing that there is time at the end to answer any questions that our um, guests might have. Um, so our residency program is very much one of is very much our legacy program. It's one of three core programs that we offer here at Bemis. Uh, we very much uh, value the creative process, experimentation, and unproductive labor, as we like to call it. Um, and as such, there are no obligations uh, placed on participating residents. Uh, just in summary, of the program itself and the pacing and volume. Um, we offer three residency sessions per year. Uh, winter, spring is one, then summer, and then fall. And we total approximately 35 national, international artists a year. And all of we've designed our program so that currently all of the artists arrive at one time and depart uh, at one time, therefore creating a true cohort, uh, which oftentimes creates a bonding uh, experience that uh, at times can also lead to lifelong uh, friendships. We receive about uh, 1,100 applications per year, and each residency session is paneled and selected by um, independent panels that rotate each year as well. We're very much a live work model um, in an urban environment. The residencies are fully subsidized uh, in that we provide travel allowances, monthly stipends, uh, private live work studios appointed with uh, private kitchens and bathrooms. And they range, each unit ranges anywhere from about 800 square feet to 2,500 square feet. The resources in addition to the LiveWork Studios um, include 24 seven access to installation and performance spaces, our Okada Sculpture Fabrication Building, which is what's pictured here um, uh, in this slide with uh, an amazing Miami artist, Nicole Jillian Mayer. Yep. And um, we also have uh, um, the art residents also have access to tools, equipment, a computer lab, and a dedicated vehicle. Since a lot of residents will come and go uh, via the air, so we need to have ground transportation uh, for practical purposes. And um, we have two in the residency program, we have two distinct tracks uh, that um, are offered during each session. Um, the sound art and experimental music program, which Dexter referenced earlier in, in my intro, uh, which was launched a few years ago, ago. This is for artists that are working in experimental forms of music composition, sound um, or music of, of all genres. And um, for artists that are participating in this part of the residency program, 
They have all of the aforementioned resources afforded to them, but they also receive a production budget to either rehearse or record new music. And they have access to a rehearsal space a and a recording studio. And we have a full-time sound technician on staff to assist them in whatever their uh, projects um, they might be working on. And then as part of the sound program, we also opened a music venue called Low End. The residents uh, have an opportunity to perform live um, at Low End um, uh, at least once during their residency session if they, if they so wish. In addition to residents performing here, we also bring in musicians and bands for one-off performances. So we present uh, two concerts a month with an average of uh, 45 attendees for each concert. And um, through uh, an initial investment of $500,000 and now totaling $1 million from the Mellon Foundation, all of the performers and the residents are, are fully compensated for uh, their time here. And that also allows us to present all of the conf ah, concerts uh, free of charge. And then the second uh, unique track within the residency program is catered for independent curators. Um, we launched this program with um, in 2017. And to date, we've had four curators uh, run through this program. The duration of the residencies really changed because we customize each residency per the curator's goals and uh, ambitions while they are in residence. Um, so we've had a curator here for 16 months. Um, our current one will be here for a year. And um, this is really an opportunity for curators to focus on um, independent research and curatorial projects. Of course, do studio visits with all of our residents um, during the residency sessions, engage the community locally, uh, but also we offer the opportunity for the curator and residents to create an exhibition or two within our galleries. We have four galleries on our first floor that um, uh, occupy about 13,000 square feet. So this is an installation shot um, of Liv Schulman's solo exhibition, which was one of uh, two exhibitions that Sylvie 14 organized for us um, a couple years ago. And as I noted earlier, um, the residents are um, are here on you know for their own um, aspirations, and it is their own time. Um, however, we do offer many opportunities for residents to engage our diverse communities here in Omaha. So we, we invite them to sign up for studio visits with area curators, go on tours to explore and then access resources within the community um, that go beyond what Bemis officers and can in a, in a very significant way supplement the resources that are available to them, whether that is a fabrication lab at a local college, to a gym membership at the local Y, uh, to um, access to the Malcolm X Foundation, you name it. So we, um, we have a number of partners um, that are aligned with our residency program that residents can make use of, um, including we offer an opportunity during each session um, for artists to share their work um, and to talk about the ideas that are unfolding in their studios through a public open house, open studios event. We actually have one coming up this Saturday um, for our current fall session. And most of the artists really love this opportunity to talk through 
um, works in progress in their studio or installations that they might have spread out through through our entire campus. And another um, facet of our residency program, which we launched relatively recently, and that is an alumni program that really um, strives to keep Bemis as an ongoing resource for artists that have participated either in our exhibition program or the residency program itself. Um, there are three core resources made available through the alumni program. Uh, one is what we call a return residency. So it's an abbreviated residency for six to eight weeks that alum can apply for. It's a fast track application process and, um, and they can come and participate alongside the other residents in any of the three annual residency sessions. We also um, provide professional networking opportunities that so far have taken shape as um, convenings that we've hosted in cities where we have large alumni populations. So since this program launched, we've done convenings in LA, New York, and most recently in Chicago. And in April, we will have our first international convening in Mexico City. Um, and that should be, and that's, you know, all of our alum are invited to that along with um, staff members, board members, and current and prospective donors. And the third facet of the alumni program is our ReConnecco Award. That is an annual cash award that we offer to an alum um, of $25,000. It's named after one of, um, one of the founders of the organization and Bemis's first executive director. And our last ReConnecco Award went to uh, Raven Chacon. Um, who is a recent uh, resident and one of the um, core advisors that helped us launch our sound program. So that is Bemis's residency program in a nutshell. Thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you, Dexter. Thank you so much, Chris. And um, I can attest to uh, how fantastic your organization is. It's been a long time, but I did make it to Bemis. I've been there before, you know, so, um, you know, I, nothing but good things to say. No, um, we're going we're gonna to move on to our next panelist. And I do have some questions for you, Chris, but obviously I'll come back to you um, with those questions. We're going to move on uh, to Nicole Martinez to tell us all about Fountainhead. <laughs> I've also visited Fountainhead before, so um, there's, there you go. <laughs> Um, it's so nice to meet you virtually, Dexter, because Catherine has always said so many wonderful things about you. And thank you for having me and for having Fountainhead as part of this discussion. I am just going to start sharing my screen. Sure. And let me just Great. do this. Okay. Okay. So at Fountainhead, we like to say that we empower artists to build a better future. And when we say that, we mean for themselves, but we also mean for all of us, because at the core of our mission is the belief that through the transformative power of not just art as an object, but the ideas that artists put forth, we can um, really change the world. And so that's kind of at the at the core of our mission. Um, Fountainhead is a very unique organization, obviously based in Miami. Um, it was founded in 2008 by Catherine and Dan Mikesell. They were, they are art collectors who really wanted to find a way to go beyond just collecting art and support artists in a way that made more sense and also kind of support their, their local community in Miami as it was beginning to grow and evolve into um, a cultural capital. And so Fountainhead in the early days was kind of like 
the place where Locust Projects or Pam or, um, you know, Mocha would send artists when they didn't have a budget for a hotel. Like Fountainhead was like, kind of supporting all of this activity locally when the institutions just couldn't make ends meet themselves. And so I really like to think of Fountainhead as being at the core of this evolution of Miami's cultural scene, because not only has it, um, you know, supported the local landscape and gotten people locally to kind of engage with the arts in a very different way, but it's also brought a, an insane caliber of artists to Miami that I don't think many of the local curators um, or gallery owners would have had a chance to meet otherwise. So reiterating our mission a little bit, uh, Fountainhead believes that elevating the voices, vi value, and visibility of artists and making their work accessible in a welcoming, inclusive environment helps us delve into the human experience and stories that connect us all. So anyone who's been to Fountainhead knows that it's inside of a, of a home in Morningside, which is very unique. Um, and we really believe that hosting artists in a home and welcoming people to meet the artists in that home and see their work really changes the way that they um, perceive the arts because, you know, it's not a gallery, it's not a fancy museum, it's it's just a house, right? And you can just come in and see artwork on the walls and, you know, stand two feet away from the artists who made it and ask them questions about it. And we really think that that engages people and opens them up in a way that uh, they may not necessarily if they were in a kind of more structured traditional art environment. So Fountainhead today has really two core main programs. Um, the first being the residency, which is a year round month long artist and residence program, which as I mentioned is hosted in a mid-century home in the historic neighborhood of Morningside. Um, each month, we offer three artists time, space, and connections to expand their careers, and we host an open house at the end of each month that invites the local community to come in and see the work that they made in residence. The second kind of flagship core program that we have is called Artists Open. Um, it's Miami's first and only countywide open studios event. So what Fountainhead does is we coordinate 300 artists all over Miami-Dade County to open their studios for about eight hours on a Saturday in May. And it's really cool because um, I think a lot of people locally don't really understand that there are artists working all over the city and, and maybe they've never even been inside of an artist studio. So it gives chance, it gives people a chance to kind of navigate their neighborhoods in a way they maybe hadn't before and also get to know a little bit about the artists making work right in their own backyard. Um, so the residency, it's a really focused approach. Um, selected artists live and work in the home in Miami. Um, as I said, it's three artists for one month at a time. I think that the crucial differentiator about Fountainhead, obviously it is a residency, so there is time and space to make work. But what we really focus on as an organization is establishing connections um, and offering artists the opportunity to get their work in front of an audience that they may not necessarily if they weren't in, at Fountainhead. So we arrange one-on-one -on -one studio visits with the artists in residence. And these studio visits are often pretty highly curated in the sense that we internally think really critically about the type of work the artist is making and who, which curators locally might want to engage with that work or offer feedback on that work. Um, and I think it's been I think it's a really great way for artists to kind of plant seeds, which is what we like to say that we do. You know, we really help people plant seeds and, and you know, when and how they harvest is kind of up to the parties. But um, it's a really great way for curators to kind of, big, you know, see what artists are working on in different parts of the country and in different parts of the world and, you know, maybe add them to their Rolodex for later exhibitions or opportunities. Um, and it's, and it's also a great way for the artist to get really critical feedback and possibly, you know, make a connection that could lead to a show. Um, another kind of really great aspect of the program is that while artists are in residence, they do get immersed locally in the, the very kind of vast cultural landscape that we've developed here in Miami. So 
there's a lot of trips to private collections, a lot of trips to museums and um, galleries. And usually those are, you know, include a curator or someone greeting them to kind of give them the lay of the land. And so I think that's a really special aspect of Fountainhead. There's always at least one day a week where artists go out into the community to see institutions. Um, and oftentimes we do kind of ask the artists, you know, if there's a, a, a an especially unique place that they want to go. Like, for example, we recently had um, the artist Natalie Ball in residence in June of last year. And she is an indigenous artist and she really wanted to connect with the Seminole tribe here in Florida. And so we organized a number of field trips out into the Everglades, into the Seminole Museum and connected her with different um, Seminole artists and, and, um, and you know, writers and thinkers. And that was a really special experience for her. Um, all artists that come to Fountainhead are provided with round trip airfare. Um, obviously their accommodations are covered. And then we also offer a $1,000 stipend to offset expenses while in residence. So it is fully subsidized plus a little extra in order to kind of pay for food and all of that stuff. Um, so the selection process is, you know, the, cura the, the curatorial committee changes every year, but the uh, format of the process is, you know, pretty much set in stone, which is that we ask alumni artists to nominate artists to apply for the program in tandem with hosting an open call, um, which allows us to kind of engage the alumni and make them feel like they're, you know, a significant uh, part of expanding the network and have a say in how that network expands. Um, and the open call, obviously, to keep it all democratic and also figure out, you know, if we're missing someone that's just not in our network, that is a really fantastic um, upcoming artist. So we've just finished our selection process for 2023. This year's curators were um, Allison Glenn, who's at the Public Art Fund in New York, Melissa Wallen, who is at the Dela Cruz Collection in Miami, uh, Rodrigo Valenzuela, who's an alum of the program, a photographer and um, a professor at UCLA, and Susana Temkin, who is the curator at El Museo del Barrio. And I'm very excited about 2023. We're announcing who's been selected next week on Tuesday. So if you don't follow us on Instagram, please do so you can see. Um, it's at Fountainhead Arts. And um, I, I would say it's it's a really healthy mix of nominated artists and open call artists, which I think just goes to show, you know, the importance of, of running an open call is in tandem with the nomination process. Um, I think it's also relevant to say that, you know, since our inception, we've really focused on um, working with artists who were not kind of the um most represented in the art world. And so, you know, in our 15 years, we've hosted over 500 artists from 47 countries. Half of them, more than half of them have been women and more than half of them have been BIPOC artists. Um, they've really ranged in age from 23 to 70 years old. And internally, you know, we're an all-female staff, we're 66% BIPOC and um, our curatorial board is, you know, similar numbers, 50% women, 60% 6% BIPOC and our board as well is, is fairly diverse. Um, so I think that obviously the, the most important aspect of Fountainhead is the alumni. Um, I'm consistently blown away by how many accolades our alumni just continue to add to their resumes. Um, a lot of Fountainhead alumni are United States artists, they're Pollock Krasner Foundation winners, they win Joan Mitchell Awards, they're, you know, granted by the Andy Warhol Foundation. We've got them in the Whitney Biennale and the Venice Biennale, the Studio Museum Residency and Prospect Five. And of course, some of our, ooh, where'd my, some of our most notable alumni are uh, Christina Quarles, Gisela McDaniel, Derek Adams, um, Basil Kincaid, Shepard Ferry, Shabalava Self. Renee Cox, Deborah Roberts, I could go on and on, but they're really just a fantastic group and and we're really proud to be, you know, a part of their journey. Kennedy Yanko is another one. I could just keep going. Deanna Lawson. Um, but yeah, okay, so there we go. 
this is just like a quick little video, which I think we're short on time. So I'm not going to show it to you guys, but if you have time later and you want to, it's on our website. It's just a little artist testimonial. Sure. I mean, if you want if you wanted to play it, it's only a minute. We have time. <laughs> okay. Well, that's my last slide because this is just some of our partners that I wanted to share with you guys. You know, we're backed by the Knight Foundation, the Perez Family Foundation, uh, the state of Florida, the National Endowment for the Arts, and we have a host of local partners and international partners. And I'll close with the video. Sure. I don't know why this is like giving me trouble. Hold on. Let's see. It's not working, guys. Well, you know, it's Zoom. You know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> we, Sorry we, about we, that. All, we all bow down to the Zoom guys. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for that. Um, really great, Nicole. And um, I haven't been to Miami in a little while, but I'm looking forward to visiting you guys down there sometime soon. Um, so yeah. Holly, um, we're going to uh, move over to you and talk a bit about Headlands. I've never been to Sausalito. However, I did meet uh, one of your colleagues years ago, actually at Bemis. So there's a, uh, you know, so it's sort of strange connection there. So anyway, let's, um, let's hear all about the work that you're doing at Headlands. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, asking me to take part in this panel. And it was really great to hear. I mean, I know a bit about Bemis, but I didn't know so much about uh, Fountainhead. So it was great to Hear your presentation. Um, I guess I'll just jump in. And um, audio is breaking up a bit. I don't know if it's, oh. if it's me. Well, it could be us. <laughs> but we'll see. Okay. So, um, Can you see? Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start then. Um, so Oops, for some reason. What's up? Okay. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Helps to have interns. Um, so, Headland Center for the Arts is located in a historic army fort. So, your audio is a bit. The audio is breaking up. Can you hear me now? It's, um, it's breaking up a bit. I can hear you. I'm wondering um, if you turn off your camera, Holly, maybe the bandwidth would be better. You can give that a shot. Okay, by turning off my camera. All right. I may have to need a hint to turn help on this because I don't see the. I don't, I don't know if that'll also affect your video, but it may be worth okay. a shot. Maybe if you stop sharing your screen for a second. All right, let's stop the share. Oh, oh wait, I'm not. So okay, stop there, stop it. Yeah, okay. Okay, does that help at all? It does. Okay. <laughs> well, that's fine. You don't need to see me. <laughs> so I'll start over. Headland Center for the Arts is located in a historic army fort in the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, which is just across the bridge from San Francisco. Um, we offer public programs and residencies for 45 national, international, and local artists each year. And we support an additional 20 artists through other residencies and fellowships. Uh, any artist living anywhere in the world is eligible to apply for a residency at Headlands as long as they can speak basic English and are not enrolled in a degree granting program. Uh, we receive about 1200 applications a year and we accept them in nine different uh, disciplines. Uh, these are our two main buildings. The first building I showed you is actually our main studio building which has 18 studios. Um, we go by the Army designation numbers, so that was building 945, so this is building 944 and 945. Uh, the building on the far left is building 944, which is our uh, main administration um, building. This is a view of headlands. Uh, you can see our proximity to the Pacific Ocean if you look on the right side of the screen. So we're pretty close. It's about a 10 or 15 minute walk. 
And this is a view of the buildings, uh, basically from the other side uh, down near the lagoon. We have four artists, four houses. The, most of them were old um, army officers housing. We can accommodate up to 15 artists living on site at once. And this is our, our writer's house, which is a uh, go to building 940. Our main building, building 944, um, is our administration building. We also have two project spaces on the upper floors. Uh, when we acquired the buildings, they had been abandoned for 13 years. So Kelly, um, oh, not working. Um, Should I well, show audio, pictures? <laughs> the, yeah, the audio is uh, is getting pretty choppy. Um, okay. So uh, I'm just thinking, you know, it kind of comes in and out. Um, okay. It should be okay if you want to um, try to continue. How about if I just flip like through photos? Episode. Okay. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> And then people can ask me later. Absolutely beautiful there, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, it's good we have the pictures. <laughs> uh, it's like wonderful po postcards, um, like making me uh, pine to visit. So since you weren't able to um, narrate your slide show, Holly, I want to start with you with some qu some more questions about Headland. So um, maybe you can get into some of what you would have said. <laughs> 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 With your without the without the aid of the slides, so. Okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. I thought you were just going to ask me questions about it. Um, let's see. I wanted I to give I, you. I wanted to just kind of give you a chance to give more of an overview. I know that you have to kind of move through those slides very quickly, so. Yeah. Um, you don't. Well, you don't. You don't have to touch on everything you would have said, but I'd just love to give you an opportunity just to share a bit more. Right. Well, I'm not sure what you heard and what you didn't hear. Uh, <laughs> so I can well, go to. The, I could go the basics. We accept about 45 artists a year, national, international, local. Any right. artist in the world can apply as long as they can speak basic English and aren't enrolled right. in a granting program. We have about 1,200 applications a year in nine different disciplines. Um, we have uh, residencies are from four to eight weeks. We have three seasons, uh, spring, summer, and fall. Artists receive a $1,000 a month stipend, round trip airfare, a bedroom and a house shared with other artists, dinner provided five nights a week by our chef, who I showed a picture of, Damon, he's quite great, and shared use of two cars so artists can get food or supplies or attend events in the Bay Area. Um, and then I think I said we have four houses, accommodating 15 artists living on site. Our main um, buildings uh, were, we have um, seven of them. They were old army barracks buildings that we have artists renovated. Um, so the, some of the rooms I was showing were artist commissioned rooms. There was the first one with the bleachers and that was by David Ireland. And then there was also the Rodeo room, which was the yellow room, which we use for meetings. Um, I think I'm trying to think, well, what else? There was a latrine, which is an army latrine. It's a rather exotic experience for a bathroom. Um, when we acquired it, it had no stalls because it was an all male army. Um, then we have our mess hall, which was renovated by Anne Hamilton. And that's where artists have uh, dinner five nights a week. Uh, then I showed Jamin, Damon with uh, artist Candice Lim. And basically Damon, our chef is happy to collaborate with artists if they have to go ideas for meals. Sometimes with international artists, they're kind of missing food from home. So he's happy. He's very good at all kinds of cuisine. Uh, I showed a picture of the commons, which was the outdoor space. It's a paved area between the two main buildings. Uh, you might have noticed there was a wall with text. That's a curated text wall that changes about every six months. The outdoor space has frankly been a godsend because of COVID. So we've been able to have outdoor dinners. And also I showed an event with Dohi Lee. Um, then I showed uh, some artist uh, studios. We have, um, let's see, about 24 studios in all. 
Uh, the studios I showed, they range from 100 to about 2,000 square feet. Um, the space I showed first with the big ball was an uh, installation by Mark Balsasaki. The second was the same space but by Zachary Royer Schultz. The third space was uh, TW5. It's collaborative. It had all the postcards tumbling out. The final space with Ben Britton Studio during an open house event. We've built some false, um, we've built some walls in the bigger spaces because, you know, the larger spaces don't have much wall space. Some artists need wall space. And so um, that was a photo of his studio during our open house. We have three open houses a year. Uh, Pre-COVID, they attracted about a thousand visitors. I think now we're maybe up to 500. It's slowly um, coming back. Um, and then finally, let's see, I showed a picture of the gym with the artist Paul Rucker. Uh, the gym is a very quirky building, rather rustic. Um, it has a basketball court on the first floor and a two-lane rolly alley underneath. Um, and then I think finally, we just shots of the site itself, which is really quite magical. I mean, I think the whole thing is you feel in many ways you're kind of a really remote location and actually you're just 20 minutes uh, from San Francisco. So I think that pretty much covered it. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, I'm certain that the artists that are joining us for today's conversation are here because they're curious about um, not only your residencies, um, but also the process mm -hmm. of getting into an artist residency in general. I know similar to grant writing and other things that artists often have to go through. It's a, it can be an intimidating process. Um, obviously, each artist has their own areas of specialty and, and strengths and weaknesses. But if you had to sort of give some general preparatory advice to artists who are thinking about applying for a residency for the first time, what are some of the things that you think that they can do? In other words, I give you an example of someone was asking me this question. I would say um, have a very well-written artist statement and make sure you have someone else proofread it <laughs> other than yourself. <laughs> That's one thing. It sounds pretty obvious, but I think that uh, not all artists are great writers and, and that's fine, but you can also rely on other people to help you with the writing process. Um, Chris, what, what are your thoughts on that, you know, that uh, question? Yes, this is, um, well, first of all, thank you, Nicole and Holly, for your presentations. It's great to have more insight into your programs. Uh, fortunately, I, I am familiar with both of your programs, but it has been a minute since I've visited. So uh, invite me back, please. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, you know, there are um, a dozen perennial questions um, that uh, novice applicants or or well seasoned artists, um, you know, remain to have or still have for residency programs, and I think one valuable and often overlooked resource is do some homework and connect with an alum that's gone through the program, and make that connection and get a sense of what is offered, what is not and the overall culture of the organization, since you are committing a fair amount of time to, to live and work at, um, at a place that is not your home. Um, so that I think is really important. And in terms of, I, I'm sure uh, most uh, residency programs use an online application platform and oftentimes those platforms provide um, image description boxes. We find that those description boxes go unfilled. Mm -hmm. And it, it is an amazing opportunity to talk more about the work you are illustrating in a, in a work sample. So that first, surprisingly, it is overlooked. So it's something that we really um, hammer home when we're talking to uh, first time applicants to to our program. Uh, I also hear often uh, give yourselves enough time to apply. It's not to be rushed uh, because it can be a complicated process. And don't be discouraged. I mean, all three of our programs along with Oxbow are uber competitive. 
Uh, I mean, we're just we're talking about 30 to 40 slots a year, perhaps, and over a thousand applicants from around the world. So apply many times. And for us, the way we time open calls, you can apply to multiple sessions within a year. So if you don't get into the summer, maybe you'll get into the fall. Um, and I don't know about Headlands um, and Fountainhead, but our busiest uh, um, session in terms of number of applicants used to be the summer. And for whatever reason, now it's the fall. So that mm. has shifted in the past two to three years. Um, so that's also something to pay attention to as well. Um, and um, yeah, so that, those are some of my initial thoughts. That's great. On, on this question, for sure. That's great. That's great. And and, and how about you, uh, Nicole? Um, so I, mine would be a, a compendium of agreeing with you both. So I, I'm a, a writer myself and bad artist statements or bad proofreading and grammar really drives me crazy. And it's the kind of thing that would make me automatically go next because it showcases a lack of professionalism. Um, I would definitely agree that you should spend some time getting to know the alum, getting to know the program. The applications that tend to stand out the most for us are the ones where they're really thinking about why Miami would be a unique place for them to be working. Um, and we just absolutely adore to get applications where the artist has like very specific ideas about the types of things that they want to either work on or research while they're here and, and really kind of embed and ingrain themselves in what the city has to offer. Um, and then it's really, it's so true. Do not get discouraged because at the end of the day, you know, it's still, even when you've got fantastic curators from all over the country, art is still a very subjective uh, thing and everyone has their own opinion and, you know, different people float to the surface for different curators. And I think that you need to just always remember that it wasn't this time, but it could be the next time. Um, images, I think a lot of times artists will put forth images that don't really showcase the material or the detail of the work, you know, never underestimate how important the images are at least for me personally, when I'm reviewing an application, the first thing I do is look at the images. Um, I go right to it because usually in an image, I can tell right away whether someone is a fountainhead artist or not. Um, so the quality of the image and, and the strength of the work is very, very important. Probably for me, the, the most important thing. Um, and after that, you know, I would look into who the artist is. I would review their CV and all of that. But the images, the images for me are kind of like a make or break, right? And I would, I would think that probably for most people as well. Um, make and then finally, make sure your CV is really up to date and think about, you know, how you can constantly add things to your CV that would make your you a desirable candidate for a residency whether it's exhibitions or press or, or what have you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and I, I, I want to piggyback on that for a moment um, for, for all of the folks that are joining us today as well. You know, you mentioned, you know, the subjective nature of the application process and, and, and it's really something that I, I think um, should be taken into consideration. I know that artists will have a tendency to try to compare their work to the work of artists who've gone through the residency, right? So, <laughs> you know, it's it's like looking at your your ex friend's profile on social media. Don't do it, like, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> all all you all you're really doing is trying to come up with a reason why that person got it and you didn't get it. And 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 comparing the artwork is not really the thing to do. I think comparing the person's perhaps comparing yourself to how professional is their website? If they have a CV on their website, how well is it organized? If they have an artist statement, how well is it written? Because it's really those things that are giving them the advantage more so than whether or not you think they're a better painter than you or a better sculptor than you. Like those are not. And then the other thing is because it's so competitive, even if you received 80 applications that you thought were fantastic and you wanted to accept all of them, you simply can't, right? There's, a, there's also right. that part where no matter how good you are, 
cut off. Yeah. And, and like, to <laughs> just kind of deepen that a little bit, you know, like when we see applications, let's say we get five applications by artists who are figurative painters, we're not going to take five figurative painters in a year. So we do have to be a little bit discerning because we want a good mix of medium and genre. And so like maybe there were just too many figurative painters that year and that's why you didn't get selected, you know? Right, right. And so Holly, um, how about you? I mean, what, what kind of advice have you, I wouldn't even say, would you give? I would actually say given because I know you've been, <laughs> you've been asked this before. Yeah. Um, well, first, I think I would uh, urge artists to do their research um, before applying. Um, there's a, the Artist Communities Alliance website is a really good resource to kind of go in and delve in and, and really investigate a, a residency. I mean, I think there are a lot of questions. Do you want to be in a city? Do you want to be in a remote area? Do you want to be among a large cohort or a smaller cohort? Uh, is there a specific equipment you need, like a press or something like that? Then I, you really need to delve in there and investigate and see uh, if the situation, you know, is the right one for you. I, I know one artist who was very influenced by um, urban signage and whatnot and went to Vermont studio and just felt like it was way too rural for, for him. So uh, it's, it's just important to figure out what's going to feed your work. Um, there's also a, a kind of a more mom and pop um, atlas called the Piney Wood Atlas. They have a website. I would encourage that. That was, I think, two women, I believe, went around the country and kind of in different geographic areas and researched some real mom and pop um, organizations. So that might be a, a good way to start. Uh, they're kind of more personal sort of places than the larger ones, um, such as all of us. Um, and then I would also, when Nicole, Nicole was talking about um, specific reasons about why that residency, uh, we always do look for that, you know, why Headlands? Why would it be important for you to work at Headlands versus any other place, you know, you could apply to? Uh, however, you have to be careful not to be too specific in our case, um, especially because, you know, we do have a lot of artists who look at the site that I just showed you photos of and think they can do outdoor sculpture, but we are in a national park and it's regulated by the National Park Service. And so that's not really possible. So if you put in your application that you want to build a big sculpture outside, uh, you might be dinging yourself before you even, you know, get started. So I would be careful to research the organization about, you know, what is possible. Um, in terms of showing images, having good images, definitely very important. Uh, and I think it's important to have maybe 10 good images versus 12 images with the last two being kind of not so strong because I've seen applications kind of be, uh, you know, uh, tossed aside, I shouldn't say that's not the really right word, discounted because uh, there were strong images, but then there were these other images that kind of confused the jurors and they, and they didn't feel as strongly about the work in the end. Uh, so I think it's important to curate what images you're going to submit. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, for, for all of the people who are attending today, um, there's a function on Zoom where you can raise your hand. And if you have a question, I can turn it on so that you can ask your question using audio. We won't use your video, but if you have a question you'd like to ask via audio, please use the hand raise function. You should see it at the toolbar on the bottom of your screen. Um, and so um, another question I have for, for you guys today, uh, well, well, before I ask this question, I, I'll also say that the research component is not to be discounted. Um, I think that one of the greatest faux pas um, anyone can make is asking a question that is on the residency's website the answer to which is on their website. It's sort of like, if you haven't taken the time to even read the FAQs on the website, you really shouldn't be sending an email asking that question. <laughs> that to me, <laughs> it's just one of, it's a personal pet peeve of mine. Um, <laughs> um, and so I thought we would make it through today's um, conversation without, without any mention of COVID, but we almost got there, we almost got there. Um, but, so I just wanted to um, sort of ask you, you all, um, in terms of navigating that, have you have you seen um, that artists are pretty much uh, past that point, and they're applying with the, in the same like level they were applying before the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've actually uh, seen an uptick in applicants um, since since um, since 2020. Great. And um, in terms of um, 
giving um, artists more info about your residencies. Do any of you offer info sessions or any sort of pre-application, um, you know, opportunities for artists to, like, the reason I wanted to do this panel is because I thought that there was a lot of, uh, you know, sort of opaqueness often around the, the, the process of like how artists get selected for residencies. But um, is this something that you guys offer uh, for, for curious artists in general, or you pretty much say, it's on our site, it's, it's on the application and, and they can kind of figure it out from there. I think our information's on our website, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I answer zillions of questions every year from applicants and I'm always happy to do that. Yeah, likewise. I mean, we don't host any specific types of workshops or anything like that at this time, um, but it's all pretty straightforward on, on the application online when it's an open call and everything you need to know about the residency is on the website and anyone who gets accepted to the program additionally gets a pretty big document about what they can expect. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions now. Um, and so also let's talk about age for a moment. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, at, at least I've, I've had a lot of conversations with older artists, you know, older is always subjective. Like, what do I mean? So let's just say artists over 50, right? Um, not old, but older, right? Um, who, some of, some of them feel that, you know, residencies are sort of like for younger artists, you know, and they, they're hesitant to apply because they feel like, you know, they don't want to be, <laughs> they don't want to be the oldest person there. I mean, what would you say to an older artist who has great track record, great body of work, would love to apply to a residency, but might be feeling a little bit intimidated, but in a different way? I totally hear that because we actually hosted a residency at the start of last year um, or this year, 2022. That was for a uh, multi-generational artist. So the artists in the residency were in their, you know, one was in their forties, one was in their fifties and one was in their late sixties. Um, and they all voiced that concern. Like, you know, we really appreciate the fact that this residency was kind of created for us because we hate being the youngest in the in the room or the oldest in the room. Um, I'm not sure why, I'm not sure why um, residencies do kind of gravitate to select younger artists, but I, I do think that older artists should never be discouraged to apply. Um, especially because like, at least for, for us, you know, we really love it when an older artist is paired with a, a younger artist and can offer that type of insight and then you know alternatively feed themselves through the work and ideas of someone who's coming up in a totally different generation so um you know don't be afraid of like the connections and the magic that can happen by virtue of the fact that you may be different and and especially for our residency which is just three artists at a time it's so intimate and um you know, it's it's not easy to feel like, oh, wow, I'm so much older than everyone here because there's only two other people. So. Right. Right. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on that before I ask my next next question? Uh, Headlands likes to have a real mix of artists in terms of younger as well as the older artists. Um, we do uh, interviews with all of our finalists before they're accepted. So actually, I would sort of turn the question around and just make sure the artist was comfortable with sharing a house with other artists, because that seems to be more the issue with with uh, with people I've I've known. Um, you know, they're used to living on their own and you know suddenly they're sharing a house with you know three other people and it's it's an adjustment. So I mean that's kind of the reality for me in terms of like I wouldn't discourage an older artist to ever to, you know, certainly they should apply. Yeah, um, I, Chris, any thoughts on that? I, I would just add that I at a certain point it is a numbers game. I think when, I mean, Bemis, like many uh, residency programs, we have, um, you know, we accept and engage artists at all stages of, of a career. Mm -hmm. And, but at the end of the day, I think younger or mid-career artists are positioned in life to have more freedom perhaps, or greater opportunity and flexibility to partake in a residency program. Um, and therefore we get more applications from 
let's say younger artists right and and if that is the case then the odds are against you know um uh older artists uh, it's just it comes down to um to the numbers thank you thank you um we're coming up to the hour now so i have one more question um and someone has raised their hand let's see who who has done that is it james james you're allowed to speak now <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all so much for sharing about your programs. I really enjoyed this and always enjoy hearing about residencies. Um, my question is actually about the career side of residencies and, and jobs within artist residencies. I was fortunate in having an opportunity to manage an artist residency program in the Hudson Valley. And I'm in conversation with another one about managing their program in the future. Um, it was a really overwhelming experience, but incredibly rewarding to be surrounded by that many artists, un unbelievably, but stretched in a million directions. And I wonder, because for me, that was an isolated experience. Um, is it that crazy every residency that one might work at? Um, and <laughs> what what other kinds of positions and where would a, what, what would a career develop to from a residency manager? Would it be working at a more prestigious residency, maybe with more resources, or, um, you know, obviously there are directors of the nonprofits that sometimes have have the residencies under them. And and any any insight into sort of career trajectories within the residency world would be fascinating for me. Thank you so much for your question, James. It's actually a really, really great one. Thank you. Well, do you want me to take that since I've been at the helm here? Please. Please. Quite please. well. I think it just depends on what you want to get out of the experience. Um, I have no desire to be an executive director. I have no desire to be a development director of residency program. I am perfectly happy sort of staying behind the curtain and facilitating residencies for other artists. You know, I get to meet them, talk with them. I get, you know, I feel like I have the best of both worlds. Um, so it really just is a matter of what your career ambitions are. If you want to be an executive director and maybe shape it and take more of a leader position, then um, I think that you could definitely stepping stone to that. I mean, oftentimes it generally tends to be the development director who kind of goes into the ED position. Um, but, you know, all I can say is I'm very happy where I am after all these years. Yeah, I really like that question. Um, Chris, Nicole, either of you want to? On that. How, did you get um, to, how did you get to be where you were? Well, I mean, maybe that's also part of the, part of the question. To be perfectly frank, you know, I, the reason I really like working at an artist residency um, after working at several museums is that mm -hmm. I, I think that there's like a total disconnect at this point between the museum and the artist and I really like working with the artist mm -hmm. I'm 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 interested in objects but I'm more interested in ideas and I think that working at a residency gets you that kind of firsthand exposure to the people making the work and it's less about the work itself and and more about the 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 ideas driving it um, so for me personally, I don't really see myself shifting out of uh, a kind of arts organization that is focused on working directly with artists. Um, I came to work at Fountainhead um, after kind of like working with Catherine in a very kind of freelance basis for years. And we just kept saying like, hey, we really like working together. This is going really well. Like we're doing a lot of great things. Like we should just, we should just keep going. We should just, and that's like how it, how it came to be. It was, it was very organic. And um, I think, you know, career path wise, it's like, it's like Holly said, you know, if you want to be an executive director of a residency is a really great way to expose yourself to all of the different facets of operations of an arts organization in a way that a museum would never allow you to, right? Because museums have, you know, very defined roles and lots of politics, boards who are way too involved in the minutia. And I think residencies are a lot more nimble and you end up doing a lot more things. And it just depends. Like, I'm the kind of person who likes to feel like I'm, you know, 
doing a million things at once. I, I enjoy that about my work. It keeps me interested. So yes, if you feel like the residencies that you've worked at are like that, it might be, it might be uh, chronic. It might be something that they're all like. Um, but I, but I think that, you know, if you cut your teeth at a residency, you can pretty much do anything afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. And, and, and Chris, any thoughts on that? I, I have many, many, um, many thoughts, but first I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with the shameless plug. Uh, Beam Center is currently hiring for a residency coordinator. Uh, our, our former residency manager was here for 10 years and decided to uh, step away to, um, to get her MFA. So she moved on to go to grad school. And I think from my experience of about 20 years in this industry, I see a lot of makers finding themselves in a residency management position and working alongside other artists and assisting those artists to accomplish their, their goals. There are pros and cons to that dynamic. And within our institution, we have um, three, three positions that comprise uh, the residency program and report to a director of programs. So when thinking about a career path and a trajectory, I would certainly research the scale of the institution and is there movement within the institution from succession from one position to another within a residency department or into another department that would equally or greater satisfy your career interests and ambitions? I mean, I consider us a relatively small nonprofit in the entire sector of nonprofits. So we don't have a lot of um, ability for upward movement within our institution. But there are a lot of other arts organizations that do provide that because they're a larger scale and have larger budgets. Right. That's great answers. I, I, I think that that question was answered with a plum. Um, so <laughs> uh, we are coming down to the final couple of minutes. Um, I wanna thank you all for your time today. Um, Chris just mentioned that there is a, uh, a position open at, at Bemis that people can apply for. Is there anything going on at uh, Headlands or Fountainhead that um, artists or administrators on today's uh, Zoom might want to know about? Are you, is, is Fountainhead hiring? Is Headlands hiring? That, those are two great questions. Um, and if not, um, what else is going on that might be of interest? <laughs> hmm. um, well, we're not hiring at the moment, but uh, we. We are going to be, so two big things. Obviously, we're announcing our 2023 artists next week. So definitely stay tuned for that. If you follow us on Instagram or um, you can sign up for our newsletter to get news about that and all kinds of other things throughout the year. Um, if you are in town for Miami Art Week, we host our open house on the Friday before Art Week begins, which is also the Friday after Thanksgiving. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, a lot of the artists that are here for the month of November stay on through Basel because they come here in November to make work that's going to the fair. So if you want to see some of the work that's going to the fairs or winding up in exhibitions before they actually get there, um, you are welcome to join us at our open house on the Friday after Thanksgiving. And then um, an exciting announcement that we will be um able to publicly discuss in around our Basel um, is coming up soon. And um, I'm very excited about it. So definitely stay tuned for that as well. Oh, wow. The uh, anticipation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and uh, Holly, uh, um, how about Hedley? Not sure. We did have one position open for sort of a groundskeeper position. I'm not sure if we fill that or not. But fairly soon, we'll be accepting applications to our intern, internship program. So for the residency, we have two program interns, and it's a paid position. I think it's eight hundred a month. Okay. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Okay. Eight hundred eight hundred dollars a month, and you uh, basically live in one of the artists and residents' houses. You have a small bedroom, it has its own bath, and then of course, you know, you're with a changing group of artists. Uh, I think it's a position. I'm not sure it may change next year, so I think it's like six months right now. 
Uh, but it's a great opportunity to see how a residency program works. If anybody who ever thought about working with a residency program, it's also a great place to meet artists who are fairly more established, particularly if you're just coming out of school, so that you can, um, you know, it's sort of an informal mentorship in a way. Um, and I hope it's a lot of fun. But <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, this concludes today's conversation on artist residencies. Uh, Nicole, Holly, uh, Chris, thank you so much for your for your time today. Unfortunately, Shannon was not able to join us, but uh, I'll check in with her to make sure that everything's okay on her end. Wishing you all a fantastic Wednesday night. Eat some good food, get some rest, and thank you so much for your time. Take care, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.